ask yourself this. How do we do with working out our salvation? How is God working in our lives? How has God worked in your life this last week? Because if you're coming here on Sunday morning and that's really wonderful and you go out of here and go, that's enough of that. Something's not going right. How did you, here's a good one. How did you do with grumbling this past week? <laughs> ah, huh? yeah, I hear a little need snickering prayer. and stuff. Need, need prayer. prayer. Yeah, that's a good one. Thanks, Mike. And how did you do with shining your light in this crooked and twisted generation? You know, it's amazing that <laughs> Paul wrote that in the crooked and twisted generation. You'd think he was here in 2018, wouldn't you? <laughs> Today we're talking about relationship. So, hands. How many here have a great relationship with your extended family? Yeah, there's a, maybe one or two people that are thinking they got it. Oh, <laughs> how about this? How many have a great relationship with your immediate family? A uh, little, little more. We're doing all right. Now, here comes a question. How many have a great relationship with your coworkers? Uh, Sean, you can't raise your hand. You're all by yourself, worker. Okay, I'm the only one in the office, and me, myself, and I, we do really good together. I know you have other people in there. Just, you know. So what's the big deal about relationship? We're going to talk about that this morning. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are here to listen to and hear from you. Gordy doesn't have much to say, but you do. So I ask you, Lord, you've said where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst of them. And Father, we're gathered in your name to hear from you, to hear how much you love us and how important relationships are to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're talking and we're following along in Philippians, so we are now up to chapter 2, starting at verse 19. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. I can't see it up there, so I better just do this. That I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, but not not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. He had a real special relationship with Timothy. I'm going to talk about that also. But I think it's necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my need. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. Question for you. Does anybody know what Lakeside's mission statement is? Come on, let's all together. Adore Jesus. Adore Jesus and... All right. Adore Jesus, make disciples. You cannot do either one of those things without a relationship. You cannot adore Jesus unless you have a relationship with Jesus. Does that make sense? Now, that's another whole sermon all on its own. We're not talking about that one today. <laughs> Because we're in Philippians and Paul is talking about his relationship with Timothy and Epaphroditus. But we cannot, and we sometimes think we can, make disciples without establishing relationships with people. I don't know why we do that. We think, well, make disciples. Let's go out on the street corner and grab somebody and tell them, you got to be saved. That will really work. I don't think so. But we're going to talk about that today. 
And it's, it's an amazing coincidence, isn't it? OK, there we go. Uh, I picked up the Point magazine. It's, it's from Converge this last week when it was in my basket. And it's talking about, does evangelism really matter? We're talking about making disciples here. And there's an article in here called The Roar of a Family. A couple of these articles I'm going to have to talk about. This one starts out saying, Canyon State Academy football games used to be played in near silence until members of a local church built life-changing relationships with the players. In the article, it says this, we're now seeing sponsorship move to mentorship, Grimm said. He's the coach. Families are meeting with athletes, spending more dedicated time talking and building relationships. It also says when student athletes can look up in the stands and see families, it's incredible. Quite frankly, when I came to games two years ago, even a year ago, the players would come out on the field and after the game leave. That was it. There weren't a lot of people there. Now the players are coming through a tunnel of people on and off the field. And those players are making, having relationships with the families as well. It's just the church. There was another one here called Go Make a Friend. It's talking about how we interact with diff people that are different from us, different cultures. But the title of this one paragraph says Relationships Matter. As you interact with people from different cultures, Laura says, it is important to get to know them before you tell them about Jesus. Go and make a friend. Take them out for coffee. Listen to their stories. Respond in grace, love, and truth. There is a person made in the image of God, she says. They may be from another culture and can do things different than you, but have fun learning those differences. As you form a relationship with them, seek to understand those differences and appreciate them. Relationships matter. Well, if we're going to talk about relationships, let's go ahead and just look it up. What, what does the, the old dictionary or Wikipedia or whatever talk about? When, I looked up relationship to talk about this, all right? There's a whole bunch of hits on relationship, and a lot of them... I'm like, is that all you're talking about with relationships? But this one kind of hit the, hit, the hit the nail on the head. Is that it? Okay, good. Relationship. It talks about this. The way in which two or more concepts, objects, or people are connected, or the state of being connected. Okay, so that's relationship. That's what we're talking about today. George Barna, in his book, What Americans Believe, wrote this. Americans are among the loneliest people on earth. That would be interesting if he wrote that article this last week or last month. George Barnard is the guy that does research, by the way. He wrote that book in 1991. Do you think we've gotten any less lonely since then? No, not at all. Dale Keene argues that our church and our relationships have been devalued, and we must seek to regain a balanced view of friendship and community. For you see, the church has even forgotten how important relationship is between us and anybody else. Brian Bill says this, and he's talking about a friend, and a friend is somebody who we have a relationship with. Does that make sense? Okay, good. A friend can encourage, affirm, and even rebuke. You can trust a friend with your secrets and with your valuables. A person may have many acquaintances and several casual connections, but good friends are hard to find. We were created for community and function more fully when flanked by faithful friends. You get the idea that relationships are a little more important than sometimes we put on them? Rosaria Butterfield, um, a woman that we've read about and uh, in our ministry, a big part of it, um, talks about how hospitality has been a forgotten art, a forgotten thing among us in, in society. But she talks about this. Rosaria says this. If you want to have strong conversations 
which you're going to have if you want to make disciples. You need to have strong conversations. She says if you want to have strong conversations, you have to build relationships. If you have good manners, you'll make sure you have strong relationships, once again here, before you have strong conversations. That's true with your children, your neighbors, and everyone else. It's hard to have a strong conversation if you don't know that person you're inter interacting with. We get these emails from Q Ideas. The last one, we just got one called The Power of We. That's a W E. Hospitality, in its essence, is a relationship a relationship between a host and a guest, of giving and receiving. In the days of the early church, hospitality meant inviting a stranger into your home and making them feel welcomed by providing a meal, shelter, and safety. In today's culture, it is easier to think of what it is that separates us. But what if we were known by our giving and our receiving instead of our self-preservation and taking? What if we practice this Christian virtue of hospitality as a response to our polarized society? For you see, and I'm going to go back to Rosaria. Rosaria Butterfield came to Jesus because of a friend's hospitality. And it was genuine hospitality. That person said, come on in whenever you need to. And she was free to come and go in that person's home and she thought that was just abnormal for, and it was a pastor that opened their doors to her. And that hospitality, that love that they showed her through their hospitality is what brought her to Christ. Now, there was, there's a guy by the name of Jay Shetty. And I just, in looking at relationships, found a clip. And he's talking about relationships big time. Jay Shetty says this, we're the generation that doesn't want a relationship. We want the facade of a relationship without the work of a relationship. We don't want relationships. We want friends with benefits. We want everything that will give us the illusion of a relationship without an actual relationship. The problem with our generation not wanting relationships is that at the end of the day, we actually do. Those people that you will meet, those people that God brings into your life, they want a relationship with Jesus Christ. They might not know that yet. You might be the person that gets to introduce them to your friend and your Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what we're talking about today, relationship between us and other people. It's that important. Jay Shetty in his, uh, that little blip that I watched also said when he was talking about relationships, tweeting and texting and emailing and whatever other electronic way you can communicate with somebody, he said that doesn't count for relationships, just in case you wanted to know. Oh, I've got lots of friends. I've got lots of relationships. If they're all on your phone, that ain't a relationship. We're going to think about and talk about relationships today and look at them through three perspectives derived from biblical wisdom. I like to look in the Bible to see what it has to say about a subject. Do you? Do you? Yeah, that's better. Oh, I guess. <laughs> These mentalities are essential in creating and sustaining a healthy relational lifestyle. First one is this. You must live in your relationships with a harvest mentality. Now, what are we talking about with regard to a harvest mentality? Paul talks about this when he says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. This is an essential mentality regarding relationships. What we're meaning is, here it is, there's an organic relationship between the seeds that you plant and what you harvest. If you plant 
peach pits. Just in case you do, please don't expect that an apple tree is going to grow. And we chuckle at that. We do. Because we think, Gordy, are you nuts? Of course an apple tree won't grow out of a peach pit. In the same way, there will be organic consistency between the seeds of words and actions that you plant in your relationships and the quality of harvest that you'll experience later. If you are planting love seeds in the people you meet, if you are planting care into the people that you meet, then you can expect them to respond in the same manner. Every day you harvest relational plants that have come from the seeds of words and actions that you previously planted. That's what Paul was saying. And every day you plant more seeds of words and actions that you will later harvest. Your relationships are continuously planted with little moment seeds of words and actions that can grow into a forest of either love or trouble. For you see, that's the way God's got it planned. If you sow seeds of goodness, you can then expect a, a harvest of goodness. I think I, I think I just went two pages on. We're going to get done really quick if I do that. <laughs> and everybody says, yeah, all right, good deal. So the first thing is we have to have that harvest mentality when we're talking about investing in our relationships. Second thing, it says you must live in your relationships with an investment mentality. Oh, that's a good one. What do you mean by an investment? We're all treasure hunters. We all live to gain, maintain, keep, and enjoy things that are valuable to us. We like our stuff. My stuff that I like is probably different than your stuff, but we all got our stuff, don't we? Stuff that we like. Our behavior in every, any given situation of life is our attempt to get what is valuable to us out of that situation. Every time we're interacting, we're, it's, it's our sin nature. We're like, okay, if I do this, maybe I can get some more of my stuff. There are things in your life that you have assigned importance to, and once you have, you are no longer willing to live without them. It talks about this in Matthew. Chapter 6, it says this, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Oh, we've heard that one before. But we'd still look for our treasures. And then at the end of chapter 6, it says this, Therefore, um, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. All these things that he's talking about, Jesus was talking about in here are, you know, what we eat, what we drink, what we wear, 